Python is known for its ease of use, its versatility, and its dynamism. And while that does work in terms of being able to you know, quickly put things together, it does open up avenues for jank. In this video, we're gonna be looking at one such avenue, which is an idea that I've been toying around with for a little while, which is what I'm calling hybrid callables, where you can get a function that is called either synchronously or asynchronously, depending on whether or not you await it. Now, believe it or not, this does actually work, but it's not without its problems. So we're gonna be looking at the overall solution and all the potential issues uh, in this video as well. And if you enjoy it, let me know, and we might be doing more of this type of video in the future. Of course, if you like the video, leave a like to let me know, and maybe subscribe if you wanna see more videos like this. If you're feeling particularly generous, you could become either a member or a patron by using the information in the description below. But with all that out of the way, Let's see just how jank we can get. So to start, I'm gonna go over a little bit of a high level explanation as to what we're trying to do here, because this is not exactly the sort of idiom that comes around um, particularly often. So it might help out some people to see uh, more of a high level overview before we get into the code, because the code, it's actually not as complicated as you might think. So initially, when we are creating our hybrid callable, what we would wanna do is we'd wanna create the function and this would be the synchronous implementation. So you'd create the normal function first, and then you would register as a hybrid callable using some sort of decorator. And then you would register an async implementation for it as a separate function, also using the decorator. And you'll see how this is done when we get into the code. And then once we've done that, um, or while we're doing that, we actually need to check uh, the function signature to make sure that it is valid. And because this is a branching operation, uh, these tend to come up as diamonds. And then within the checking signature, if it matches, then we, we want to continue the registration. And then if it doesn't match, uh, then we need to just error out and say, hey, you need to do something about this. Uh, so what I mean by the function signature is do the synchronous and asynchronous implementations have the same inputs and outputs? So are they going to be taking in the same things? Are they going to be returning the same thing? Uh, because if they're not, then that's going to cause problems when you go to call it. Uh, so I'm just making this as small as possible so it fits on here. And that is pretty much just our uh, creation of a hybrid callable. To create another one, get rid of that. Uh, so this chart will now be um, the actual logic flow of calling one of these hybrid callables. Um, so first things first, the user calls the function, and this can be synchronously or asynchronously, um, so using await or not. Uh, but we need to check whether it was called as async or not. And this will be a diamond again. And if it wasn't, we'll do this first. Uh, we just need to call the function straight up. So if it wasn't uh, an asynchronous call, we just call the function as normal, return the value back out, easy peasy. And I'm gonna move this over here. If it was an async uh, function, then what we need to do is we need to return, uh, actually, before we do that, we need to check if an async implementation, if I could type, has been set. Uh, and that also needs to be a diamond. And that also needs to be yes, like that. So we need to check if an async implementation has been set. If that is the case, then we just want to return our awaitable, like that. And if it's not the case, then we want to error uh, because there is no asynchronous implementation to await. And if I just make that smaller again, there we go, that just about fits. I'm trying to kind of keep everything in and <laughs> and zoom things in so people can see it. So that's, but also everything is on the page, which is quite difficult. So to run over that again, we create the function, we register as our hybrid, we register the async implementation, uh, once we've created it, obviously. You could probably put in another step here saying create the async implementation, but we'll leave that for now. We then need to check the signature. If it matches, then we continue the registration and all is good. If it doesn't match, then we error out. Uh, when we actually call the function, we check if it was called asynchronously. If it wasn't, then we just call it straight away and return the normal value. If it was called asynchronously, then we need to check if an async implementation has been set. 
If it was, then we return that awaitable. Um, and if it wasn't, then we error out. Hopefully that all makes sense. If you're not following this so far, then maybe the code will help you out, which is this. Um, so yeah, there's quite a lot going on. Let's go to the bottom first, because this is where kind of the everything is done. So we start by creating our async implement or our synchronous implementation, sorry. And we're just using an add function. We're not actually doing anything that requires asynchronicity just because well, we don't need to. And it's, it's just a little bit easy to explain. And this takes two ints and returns an int and then just simply does that. And we use this decorator to register the function as a hybrid. And once we've done that, we go up here and then we just return this hybrid callable object and then pass the function through. This hybrid callable object has a synchronous and async uh, implementation set. When you initialize it, you set the synchronous um, implementation just as it comes through and you leave the asynchronous one alone. And then we go down here and because this is now a hybrid callable object and not the actual function, we now have access to this async implementation method, which we call here, which is also a decorator. And that takes a function and you can see the signature is identical. And you can also see that the name doesn't matter. Uh, so we come in here and this is where we check if the if the function signatures match. Um, so you could just use inspect.signature for that pretty easily. And then if it works, then we set our async to the coroutine and then we return the coroutine out. Um, so you can now call it, if you wanted to, you could call this directly. You'd obviously give it a different name, but you could call it directly if you wanted to, because this just is the function now. Uh, and so when you actually go to run it, uh, you have this x equals add and then y equals await add. What this does is it takes this call. So because you're calling an object, um, it needs to have this dunder call. And functions are just objects that have this dunder call in them. And this is run whenever you call an object. You just take the args and the quags. You have this self.dispatch, which gets the respective, um, either the function or the coroutine, and you just pass everything through to it. This self.dispatch first checks to make sure there is a context. I think there are instances where there can't. I'm not sure when that crops up, but you're better off being safe anyway. Uh, and to actually get whether or not it was called asynchronously, we can use inspect.stack. And in this case, it would be the second frame from the top. And I will show this in a bit more detail. And then we get the code context, which is just the line of code. Uh, and then I'm uh, that returns either a tuple or a list. I don't actually remember. Uh, but the zeroth one is the line of code. And what we're doing here is we're getting a list of tokens. So we're tokenizing the line of code and then we're just getting the actual string tokens out of it and then returning that in a list. And this is basically just checking is the token immediately before the function call and await or not. If it is, then, or if it isn't, sorry, it does it the other way around. If it isn't, then it returns the synchronous implementation. If it is, it then checks to see if we have an asynchronous implementation. And if it does, then we run that instead, or we return that instead. And that's then able to be awaited. If we then run that, uh, script.py, nope, because there's two of them. <clears throat> we can see that uh, x, oh, I should probably do some better uh, debugging just to show it off a bit better. Uh, da -da -do. Just to show off that x, which is set synchronously, indeed returns 5, and y, which is set asynchronously, indeed returns 9. So everything works as expected. At runtime, we are able to figure out whether or not we want to call this function synchronously or asynchronously. So to explain the internals a little bit better, what I've done is I've added some debug text. So here we're printing the uh, the frame from the expect stack. We're only printing the second one, otherwise it prints a hell of a lot of information, but this is the one we need uh, specifically. We're also going through and printing all the tokens that the tokenizer found within the line. And then we're printing, you know, what this map function does as well. Uh, and then, yeah, we can run that. And I'm only running it on one, not two. Otherwise, it comes out with even more information. But you get all this here. So first, you get this frame info, which is what I'm highlighting now. And we get a, you know, a good amount of information about the actual frame 
object, we get the file name, we get the line number, we get the function name as well, which is pretty cool. Uh, we also get the code context or the function, like the scope, I guess. And this code context is what I mean here. So this code context, yeah, it is just, I'm not sure if, the, I think this prints, like it's a list of each line, but in our case, the, the context is only a single line. Uh, and this is our line of code here that we want to use. And then we have some other stuff here that we don't really care about. This uh, code context thing is the only thing we care about really. But I just wanted to show this off just for explanatory sakes. We then get all these different tokens. And these are all the token infos. So you start with your encoding one, an indent, which comes out like this. And you have your name. So names are, you know, things like X. So in our case, this X is our uh, variable name. And then the operator, which is our equals here. And then we have our name here, which is, um, you know, the function name. And this is what we're tracking. I probably should have done actually this one, not the other one. So you can see on this one, when we have our function name add, we have a wait directly before it. And this is what the, uh, the dispatcher is looking for. So it's looking to see if this value equals a wait or if it equals something else. If it equals something else and it returns synchronous, if it returns a wait, it's the asynchronous version. And the rest of this we don't really need to care about though it is you know, fully tokenized. And this is what that mapping does as well. So it, you know, it looks through and it checks to find the index of the function name, which is add here. And it looks at the one before it, which is this one here. And then it does you know, what I just said before. So that's basically the idea of it. Uh, there are a few problems with this implementation, I am fully aware. So the first thing is that if you run it via asyncho.run or you know, potentially create task or asyncho.gather, this is not going to work. You would need to do extra work to make that work. I haven't done that yet, um, mainly because I've been trying to make this type safe, which is the other problem, that this isn't type safe. So obviously this inspect.stack is only available at runtime. It, it's not going to know what the stack is going to be before this point uh, or in the type checking stage. So there's actually no way that it can work out whether or not it should be returning the value or an awaitable that will await and then return the value. I did try and get around this and this is what I came up with. So if we start at the bottom again, because that might be a little bit easier, we have these type hints and these type hints do actually work. So if I go to add down here, it will see that type hints are correct. So it's seeing that it, it takes an X, which is an int and a Y that's an int and returns an int. It also does that for here as well, because it's the same. Um, yeah, these will find if we were to do something like this, it would start complaining and say that it's not valid, which, you know, all that stuff works. All the actual type checking stuff on this end works. Um, we'll go into here real quick. So the actually, no, we're going to here. So this P param specs are really useful for this sort of thing. So you can pass a param spec p.args and then p.quags into here. And then that will essentially take everything out of the original function signature, uh, which is how you end up with uh, your uh, linting system being correct on these things. So that's essentially how that works. Um, but my idea was to return this container object, which could either be the return type or an awaitable that returned the return type. And this was supposed to implement this kind of promise that it is type safe at runtime, which it is. It is type safe at runtime because if there's an await some somewhere, it's always going to have, uh, it's always going to return the, the coroutine. So I then tried to use this to then implement that promise into static type checking. And it didn't work out so well. Uh, so I couldn't figure out how to do it. I thought I could get it to do it using type guards, but I just could not like figure out how to get it working. So you can check that something is a coroutine, but for some reason, um, the the coroutine checks, especially the one in inspect, so inspect is coroutine type, is not a type checking thing at all. That only works at runtime, which seems really weird because it, 
I, I don't know. It seems like it should be able to do it in like at this point, especially considering there is a coroutine type, which if you check the type using the coroutine type, that's still not enough for it. It still doesn't work. And this is the problem I was having, because if that worked, this would probably work. And this is why I ended up getting really stuck. So if someone does know, and I will be putting this code in in the um what in a GitHub repository somewhere and link in the description. If you want to play around with this, knock yourself out. If you can get it working, please let me know how. <laughs> or just open like a PR or something. Because I really want this to work more than anything, but I just can't quite figure it out because the complexities and the the intricacies of it are so annoying and specific. But this is why I'm intentionally showing this off as a janky piece of Python rather than an actual tutorial. And I guess this does show that you know, static type checking really does work for its purpose. It stops you doing crazy stuff like this. <laughs> I don't know, maybe that's better in the long term. It also goes to show just how jank Python can be if you really put your mind to it. And this is far from the most jank that you can make it. Like Once you get into stuff like descriptors, which I've never even touched before, you can start essentially almost rewriting half of the language. It's pretty mental. Let me know in the comments if you want to see more videos like this. I know this is a little bit of a departure for what I normally do. But I thought it'd be fun just to have a look at some really weird stuff you can do. If you also know of any other like really weird stuff, uh, really crazy stuff that you want me to look at, then do leave it in the comments below and I'll have a go because I, I want to see how broken Python can really get. <laughs> I also want to say a huge thank you to my amazing patrons and members on screen now, especially Mazar Rashman III for being so generous. If you want to learn how to use Redis in your Python application, or if you don't want to use Redis for those reasons, uh, either Redict or Valky, it works with as well. Then head over to last week's video where I showed off how you can use the Redis SDK to interface with those things. And I'll see you in the next one for whatever we do next.